A quick thank you to the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Data Magnet, Cat Crab Lobster, Duck Machine, Try Again 95, Astray the Dreamer, Mezik, Budic Joel, German Chemist, Casper Arnholtz, and Chaos to Must. Thank you very much. Story number one. They Know. Written by Echoing Cascade. Infiltrator expert Zarima was done for. Her comfort was blown, her getaway vehicle total, and she was now staring at a group of armed security guards advancing towards her in an underground garage. The lead guard stepped forward, weapon holstered, hands visible. Officer, ma'am, please follow us back inside. She didn't have much choice. Any of the death wilders could catch her if she ran and then end her life, even without the aid of the slug throwers that they carried. Besides, it's not like she could hide it either. She was, after all, a well-known political candidate. Well, not for long, I guess. She was a precursor to the Rushka invasion force. Her race was not really one for needless bloodshed, so they would place agents in primitive planets and have them elected into positions of power. Once elected, they would prepare the grounds for integration into the Rushka coalition by slowly implementing their policies. That way, when the first contact took place, the primitive planets would be easily folded into the coalition. The problem was that she'd been found out, not for doing something wrong, quite the opposite actually. I believe I'm the first politician to be looking at torture, with a section, and what is left of me will be put on display in a lab, all because I refuse to be primed. Do a smear campaign against my political rival and put forth a fair and realistic campaign plan. The officer, a man named Lo, from what she could read of his name tag, guided her back into her office. Odd. I expected them to restrain me and rush me into a lab. Hell, a shot to the back of the head in a car trunk would have not been out of place right now. Lo, ma'am, we have a few questions. Zarima was mostly confused now, but they weren't kidding or torturing her. Her secretary even served a tea. Zarima, go ahead. She sipped at her tea, looking cool and relaxed, while screaming in her head. Lo, you are an alien, correct? Zarima, yes. Lo slowly nodded as everyone else in the room started murmuring conversations. Lo, what is your purpose? Why run for office? This is it. This is the big one. Do I lie or do I tell the truth? Oh, what the frack. If I'm gonna die, might as well die with my integrity intact. Zarima, I am the first step in removing planet Earth's head of states and replacing them with members of my species, so one day Earth can be added to our coalition of planets. Zarima closed their eyes, expecting gasps, shouting, or maybe gunfire. And yet, are they cheering? When she opened her eyes, everyone in the room was celebrating. To say that she was lost would be an understatement of the century. No, ma'am... Lo sat back down and looked her in the eyes, a grin on his face and hope in his eyes. Zarima. Uh, y- yes? Lo. How can we help? Zarima. I, uh, wait, uh, what, wait, what? End of part one. Part two. They know and they don't care. Linda Crate, as Zarima was known to her human persona, was well on her way to win the election. The final hurdle was tonight's debate. I need to win this, but I'm not certain the strategy my human aides have come up with will be enough. I mean, uh, it can't be that simple, right? The debate was live and broadcast throughout the world. The fact a recently unknown political candidate was on the verge of victory was on some interest, but the fact that she was doing so with fairly mundane campaign promises and very realistic goals was shocking. Her opponent promised to revitalize the economy and bring it back to levels not seen in decades, while bringing hundreds of thousands of jobs back to the country and fixing issues that have plagued the nation for centuries. She, on the other hand, promised a 3.34% GDP increase on year one, 251 on the second, and past that she couldn't speculate. She would try and bring jobs back with government subsidies, but the budget didn't permit large enough incentive to bring more than a few thousand back. Not while the economy was still recovering, and as for the social issues, she would institute some long-term programs but didn't expect real change to occur in her lifetime. 
She also refused to do any lobbying, and her campaign was funded solely on individual donations. The back and forth of the debates issue was over. Neither candidate said anything new, and now it was time for the closing arguments. Moderator. Candidate Stone, your final statement. Stone. I will keep this short. You all know me. I have worked for this country all my life. To better it, to make it stronger and safe. I care for each and every one of you. Candidate Great is unknown quantity. A wild card, a risky bet. Sure, she can spin a good story, but that's all they are. She keeps pushing numbers and making up excuses. I can bring the change this country needs. Next week, remember to vote for me, Brad Stone. Moderator. Candidate Crate. Linda Crate cleared her throat. Here goes nothing. Linda. I can't promise the moon and the stars. Not because I don't want to, but because I couldn't deliver. No one could. What I can promise, however, is to better the lives of the vast majority by reallocating resources in a much more efficient way. Candidate Stone claims all I do is spin stories, which I find odd, when at this very moment on my official campaign site the complete step-by-step -step plan to achieve every campaign goal is available, with projections, numbers, and how they were calculated. I can't say I care about each and every one of you. She stopped to take a deep breath. Linda, the truth is, I don't care about any of you, but what I do care about is this nation finally achieving its full potential. The sound of clapping and cheering was deafening. Linda Crate had taken office after a landslide victory. Her campaign roadmap was slightly off mark because of an unforeseen natural disaster, but they were making up for lost time thanks to a better trade agreement than expected. Her refreshing approach to politics, honesty, and realism was a welcome change, and soon many others like her would follow suit across the world, though very few actually knew just how much like her they really were. In the fullness of time, Earth's first contact with Rushka coalition took place, and they were delighted to learn that they had so many values in common. They prized individual freedom as long as they did not infringe on the freedom of others, they felt that healthcare, education, and the rights to dignified end were needs as basic as food and shelter, etc. Though it was noted by many that a suspicious amount of people weren't as surprised as they should have been, given the enormity of the occasion. Earth was by then no utopia, but when they took to the stars they were their new friends, it seemed less like a dream and more like a realistic goal. End of story. Story number two, Human Shipbuilding Philosophy, written by Dragonson04. Most sentient and space-faring races of the Milky Way build ships of all kinds following a specific pattern. First, they design the ship, accounting for basic comforts such as crew quarters and other open spaces. They account for the height and widths of the corridors to accommodate the future crew members of a single or perhaps many different species aboard the ship. Next, they figure out the power connections to the engine, atmosphere, recycling systems, processes for food, and the breaking down of waste. Then, they make sure the computers can access any and all parts of the ship, so that in an emergency situation, a single terminal can control critical systems. Then, and only then, do they consider how to put weapons on the ship, if it is to be a ship of war. But, as with most things, the humans do things differently. First and foremost, the humans build a gun. Not just a gun, or a massive collection of smaller guns, but a single gun of colossal size and firepower. Then, they build a ship around that gun. No matter if it's a trading vessel or a ship for war, the gun comes first. Sometimes the gun is at the bottom of the ship, often mistaken for an engine intake, like the sister ships based around the FTL dock Leviathan, effectively making them look truly titanic and slightly upside down versions of human firearms. Other times, the ship is literally built around the gun making the end of the barrel a hub or axis on a wheel, cylinder, or gear shape. 
and in times of war. Well, the humans have an odd habit of making guns that are capable of FTL. Literally just a gun with enough to get that gun into FTL. Fewer than 10 crew members controlling navigation, the FTL drive and pulling the trigger on those things. Living in a few pressurized spaces within the gun and operating the whole thing from there. A single one of these Alamo class ships held off a hostile invasion of an entire solar system. Its power was comparable to several supernovae. Humans are an odd bunch, even for death world types. But their philosophy works. In the 50 cycles since they entered the larger galactic community, no one has declared war on them. They are always ready and ever vigilant for war, and have persisted in other conflicts of many species, as noted above. But they have never been personally attacked. Their well-out-of-the-way home system has never once been disturbed. With the obvious display of their shipbuilding philosophy, they have a sort of unspoken philosophy, and yet all humans know it by heart. They call it, fuck around and find out. Report by Callan Dorga, Stoll Military Analyst, Censored for Public Consumption. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. Uh, 